talking about the goodness of God today. Anybody interested? All right. Well, good. You're at the right place. We'll talk about the goodness of God this morning. You've heard this before. Fill in the blank. All right. The family that prays together. Eh, okay. We could probably have a sermon on that, couldn't we? Uh, for today's purposes, I want to tweak that just a little bit. If, if you'd show this picture, Kelly, there's our family. All right, you see? Now, here, look at Molly in the back. She's going, aha, I'll smile. The rest aren't paying attention, but I'll smile. But um, in this case, the family that eats together stays together. All right? And there's something true about this. The family that eats together. And why do I say this? Is because how many of you actually eat together anymore as a family? I mean, a few of you maybe, but I mean, these days it's chaos. And everybody's running here and everybody's running there. And if you have kids, you're doing this and you've got this to go to and this to go to. And, and so you grab something, you throw it in the microwave and, you know, everybody's just on the run. And so it's hard to do anything together anymore, specifically that of eating and there's something about eating together, because when you eat together, you're around the table together, and uh, you're sharing the stories together, at least for me, uh, for Mary Lou and I, uh, over the years when our boys were growing up, that was our catch-up time. I don't mean ketchup and mustard, I mean catching up, all right? And so that's when we would catch up with one another, check in, see how it going, and you know, if they were in football or some of that, how did practice go, all these kind of things. It was just one of those things that was very important for us, and so we tried as hard as we could, not all the time, but as hard as we could to, uh, to eat together, emphasis being on together. It's there that the conversations occur around the table. It's there where we tell the stories. You've heard me tell you this many, many times. It's all about the what? It's all about the story, because we all have stories to tell. Stories impact our lives. We are a part of stories. We are in each other's stories many times. And so today I want to talk about that because Jesus is excellent at telling stories, all right? And Jesus is also good about sitting at a table and, and eating. Uh, most of his parables, many of his, were around a table. Uh, Jesus liked to eat, so I'm, I'm all in favor. I'm in for following Jesus, uh, okay? Because, I mean, if he likes to eat, I do too. We're good with that. So here Jesus is on this day. Um, inviting people into a story as he's around a table. Last week, Jesus was around a table as well. Luke chapter 11, it was a little more difficult discussion last week because if you recall, it was those times when Jesus was issuing warnings to the religious leaders about hypocrisy. And six times he said, woe to you, either Pharisees or teachers of the law or whatever. Warnings to them. This week, Jesus is again at a table. The implication is that he is eating with some folks here. He's at a table, and at this particular table and this particular uh, passage today, we see that Jesus is telling some stories. In fact, there are three stories within the story we're going to find out. And the stories that are being shared by Jesus are inviting all to listen closely. Now the series that we're talking about, Listen to Him, is that we would indeed listen to Him. And Jesus is inviting those around the table and us to listen closely. For in reality, we're going to find ourselves somewhere in this story. Okay? Now the stories that I'm talking about today are within the story found in chapter 15 of Luke. Now, if you know anything about chapter 15 of Luke, it's 32 vo verses long. I'm not going to read all 32, all right? Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some of the verses. I'm going to fill in some blanks. And if you've been raised in the church, you know the stories, wh which are a part of the story, at least somewhat. If you haven't... Uh, then it's perfect as well because you're going to hear what happens in, in this story. If you were raised in the church, I want you to pretend like you've never heard this before. All right? It would behoove you, okay, to listen as if you've never heard it before. 
And so we have what's known in Luke chapter 15 by many as the prodigal son. Uh, The flip side of it is that of the loving father and then all the stories that are within that. So let me set the context with you from the first two verses, all right, of Luke chapter 15, 1 through 2. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, what? Muttered, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about this as we go along, but here, here Jesus is at a table. He's with these tax collectors, which it's almost April 15. We're just loving it right now, right? We get it. Tax collectors and sinners, they are equated. If you are a tax collector, you are a sinner. And so he's gathered with them around the table having conversation, and there's these religious leaders who are muttering. Now, in our first service, I didn't do this on purpose, uh, in the first service, two of the hymns that we sang out of the three had the word mutter in it, M-U-T-T-E-R. I thought, wow, how appropriate that in those hymns, God chose the, those particular hymns. Now, the Greek word here for, for mutter uh, means to grumble intensely. I know none of you ever do that. To grumble intensely or to complain heavily. And it's continuous in grumbling. Do you know any continuous grumblers? Well, that's what we're talking about here. Now, if you were to do a little more in the word study here, you'd see that the, the uh, implication is it likens the muttering to the buzzing of a bee. For the bee continues to buzz. And so on and on, the religious leaders are muttering upset because of Jesus who is spending time eating a meal with these low-life sinners. Okay, fast forward a notch. Verse 4, suppose, now Jesus is paying attention, he is always aware of what's going on, and so he perks up and he says, okay, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now if you recall, this is in verse 4, and if you recall in the story, that the one who has the hundred sheep leaves the 99 behind, remember? And he goes and he searches. And he searches. And he finds. And he finds the lost sheep. He puts the sheep, the lamb, on, on his shoulder and comes back and is rejoicing. We have a lost sheep that was found. There's a song out right now, or it's been out a little while now, called Reckless Love. Anybody heard it? Reckless Love. Yeah, many of you. By Corey Asbury. Interesting name, okay? But uh, a great song. Google it if you want to check it out, all right? Reckless Love. It talks about the leaving of the 99 for the one, the lost sheep. Fast forward another notch. Or, Jesus says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. This is in verse 8. Well, we think, well, big deal. Well, it's a big deal because it's a day's wage for this woman. She's lost one of the coins. So she sweeps and she sweeps and she cleans and she cleans and she sweeps some more until she finds the coin. And as she finds the coin, she rejoices and she tells others about the finding of this lost coin. And there is much joy in the household. A lost coin. And then we get to the, really, if you want to say, meat of the passage. You remember the old Wendy's commercial, where's the beef? Well, here it is. In verse 11, verses 11 through 13, Jesus continues, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there what? Squandered his wealth in wild living. We have a lost sheep, we have a lost coin, and now we have a lost son. And you've heard the passage probably before and all that goes on that follows. We'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, dynamics that play into this. And I was looking at this and thinking about this lost son and a little bit of the reason for his lostness and begin to put some things together, and you would too, 
But as, as we look specifically at this third story within the big story, we see that sin and lostness go hand in hand. There's some things that are occurring because of sin that this young son is lost. So I want to start out with talking about, first of all, the strategy of sin. All right? The strategy of sin. Here's the reminder. Jesus is at the table. And we're kind of going, well, that's really nice. Well, it really is nice. It's a big deal. In Jesus' culture, it's a, the table. When you ate a meal, it was a place of relationship. Okay? Relationship. Where you were there together, it meant that you belonged, it meant that you were accepted, it meant that you were a part of the, of the group there, and so that was a big deal. You did not just invite anyone to your table. And here's Jesus inviting sinners and tax collectors to his table, which implies he accepted them, that they belonged, and that he was in relationship with them. That was rather problematic to the religious folks. You see, what happens is sin destroys relationships. And so we have relationships that are broken all over the place here. We have Pharisees, which are the religious part of the religious leaders, the teachers of the law. We have sinners and tax collectors. Never the twain shall meet. So there's broken relationship there. There's broken relationship between the sinners and tax collectors. There's broken relationships between the Pharisees and the and religious leaders. And then, of course, there's broken relationships between all of them and Jesus, if you will. And so there's all sorts of mess going on. And we see that sin destroys relationships. Now, the story is for both, okay? Both the sinners and the religious folks. What we have is this son, the younger son, is in an estranged relationship with the father. And here's what he, in essence, is saying. It is all about me. It's all about me. To use a big word, I, I use this word with the 8 o'clock crowd. It was kind of early for him, all right? So I'll use it for, for you now because it's a little later on in the morning. Sin is anthropocentric. How do you like that word? What's that mean? It means it's me-centered. Anthropos, meaning humanity. Centric, centered. So it's, it's humanity-centered. It's all about me. If I was to put the word sin, three letters, S, little s, great big I, and a little n, because it's all about me, all right? All about me. All about I. You remember the country song? I want to talk about me, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about number one, oh me, oh my, right? You know, that's what it is. And so here's this younger son who is at the center of his universe, who is living for the moment. He has no care for the past about how he got to where he is. He really has no care about the future and how this relates to, to anybody other than him. Give me what I deserve, which sounds like a commercial for accident insurance, right? You ever see? Surely Brad will save the day. He'll ride on in, in, on, in a bull, right? He'll ride on a bull and he'll save the day because I want what I deserve. Give me what I deserve. I mean, that's our mindset these days because it's all about me. You know who I'm talking about? Postotnik? Y'all with me? Okay, just making sure we know what commercials I'm talking about. All right? I'm not talking about your brother, Cindy. I just thought about that. <laughs> Brad. All right, it's all about me. So, no thought of consequences. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about his dad. He doesn't care about his brother. He doesn't care about anybody. He doesn't care about collateral damage. He doesn't care about the impact on others. Just give to me what I des deserve. Now, here's the problem. For those that are listening, and specifically the religious leaders, this is horrific. You do not, as the younger son, ever, ever request from your father your inheritance. Because in essence, you are saying, I wish you were dead. Okay? The younger son is never to do that. The inheritance, and double the inheritance, always went to the older son. But you never went to the father, younger son, while he's living and say, give me my inheritance. That is a huge slap in the face of dishonor, of disrespect, of shaming the Father. How dare you? And that's exactly what the religious, thinker, religious leaders were thinking. How dare you say that to your Father? Get out! 
get out. And you know what? He does. He leaves because he wants it for himself, and he leaves. It says he goes off to a distant land as he gets up and goes. And what we see here is that sin, because it's all self-centered, separates and isolates. If you see what happens here in this relationship, is it separates him from his father, and he ends up going off to a distant land. And if you recall the distant land and what happens later on when we read, this is not a Jewish territory. This would be a Gentile land. Because Jews did not care for pigs, okay? So you read that a little later. And so he's off into a distant land, separated from his family and, and so forth. Now think about this with me. If you're part of the sinner group, if you're part of the tax collector group, what is going through your mind? More than likely they're going, great, just great. More ammo against us. Because these were the separated ones. These were the ones off in the distant land, if you will. These are the ones who were isolated. These were the sinners. These were the ones to get out, get out of my way. And they're thinking, oh great, Jesus is telling a story on us, which I don't know why he even let us eat at the table because he doesn't really want us here after all. The second piece of this is that sin leads to consequences, all right? Consequences. I've said this many times. Life is about choices. Choices lead to consequences. Sin leads to consequences. It's like, it's like there's times where we just go, what just happened? Without even thinking that something could happen because we sinned or because we disobeyed. It's like your kids, you know when they're growing up? And your kids, they, they disobey, and you give them a little pop or whatever, however you handle it these days. And they look at you like, what, 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 right, Ella? Why are you looking at mom like that? Yeah, she, she agreed. And so it's kind of like, well, what do you mean? Well, there are consequences for our disobedience, for sin. Sin is a break of relationship. It's a missing of the mark. Now, let's think about consequences for a minute. You know, at times we find ourselves in situations that are out of our control. I mean, it just is. Yesterday, here's an example. Yesterday morning, Kane gives me a phone call. I'm going, okay, what's Kane calling me for? It's like 8 o'clock, something's up. I know he's supposed to be heading to Ark City here pretty quick. What's going on? I answer the phone. Somebody had been out at our vans, decided to either cut the gas lines or whatever, and so he's trying to take kids to Ark City, and he'd gone to the gas station, think, well, I guess it's just on, on empty, and he goes and he's putting gas in, he looks underneath, pshh, Okay, so he gets it back here, he calls Michael, calls Dick, and, and, I, and so call him back, and I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll come in, you get your car, I'll take my Explorer, we'll load the kids up, and we'll at least get them down there. All right, long story short, somebody crawled under at 5.30 yesterday morning and, took a, and punctured a hole in the gas tank to drain out the gas. And we've been having some problems with that on, a t on occasion. Well, that, in a way, is out of our control, it was out of Kane's control, all right? Now, if he'd have, if he'd have known... If Cain would have known that the gas tank was empty the night before and knew that, oh, no, I'm late, blah, 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 then that's, you know, that's kind of on him. He's going to be running late, all this kind of stuff, out of his control. But there are things that are in our control, and this is one of those times because we have a young son who makes some really stupid decisions, and as a, as a result, he chose to leave and then all of a sudden he lived out the consequences. And my Clint Eastwood, part of me, wants to say to him, serves you right. Anybody with me? Come on. I, I can tell by looking at you. You know, we are not happy that you made that decision. And it feels good when something happens to those who make bad decisions. Right? Hmm. I'm not sure if you're just thinking pondering or trying to be honest the early service came to great conviction early <laughs> but that's that's what the pharisees that's what the religious leaders are thinking sinners get what sinners deserve right serve them right you know if you want to go off young son if you want to go off and blow your money 
If you want to go and just where your wealth runs out and where your world caves in and when all of a sudden you have famine in the land and all of a sudden you're hungry, wah, 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 you know? Now you have to eat with the pigs. You're even starving for the pods that the pigs eat. Now you don't even get those. Too stinking bad. That's kind of how we feel a lot of times, if we're honest. And so, you know, the Pharisees are going, Bravo! Nice move, young son! Bravo! What did you expect? Don't come crying to me. And the sinners and the tax collectors who are sitting around the table... Their head has just dropped another notch going, ugh, because they sensed Jesus was likening them to the younger son. Now, if we left right now, it'd be kind of a tough go, wouldn't it? But here's, here's the deal. There's some good news, because here's the deal. Sin does not have the last word, all right? Anybody interested in that? Sin does not have the last word. Thank you, Ella. This is where the story takes a turn, you know, when we, when we talk about the rest of the story. So let's go there. Sin gives way to grace. Now sometimes you have to hit rock bottom before you realize it's not the end, but the beginning. Okay? And some of you maybe been there, or maybe you're there right now. Maybe you feel like you're there right now. Where you're so low, you have to look up to see the bottom. Where you're so low, as somebody said, you play handball against the curb. I mean, you know, it's, you're, you're just low. And so, there's nowhere else to go but up. And sometimes you just have to hit the rock bottom. I mean, sometimes. And, and, and more often than not, it's because of decisions that we keep making, that we keep making, that we keep making, that we know we shouldn't make, but we do. Because we get ourselves stuck in that cycle. So here's this son, the youngest son, at his lowest point, when Scripture says he came to his senses. I love this. Scripture says he came to his senses. Jesus is telling the story. They're all pretty well glued to Jesus, really listening, and he says this younger son, after he realized he really blew it, came to his senses. And as he began to think about what he should do, he's thinking in his mind, at least if I could go back, maybe I could, I could at least be a servant. I could at least serve. Because if I could go back and serve, I'd at least have something to eat and some clothes to wear. And so in verse 18, he says, I will go back and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He's mulling this around. He knows that uh, he's going to have to eat some crow. He's swallowing his pride. He's oops. But it says he got up and he went. And what's important here are some couple theological words, really. Uh, confession and repentance. Confession and repentance turn us back to the Father. Now confession, here's what confession means. Literally it means this. It means that I agree with. And so the confession is I agree with the Father that I have messed up. That I have oopsed. And the repentance piece of it is the turning around. Literally. Literally. It's not just saying I'm sorry, because more often than not, when we say I'm sorry, we're just saying I'm sorry because we got caught, right? Repentance suggests, and more than suggests, that we are doing a turnaround, that we are no longer going to walk this way, do these things, but we are intentionally going to go this way and do this which God would have of us. And, and seek to be intentional not to make those mistakes again. Now, if you make a mistake again, know this. It's okay. I mean, it's not okay in the sense to keep doing that, but you know, God's not going to just hang you up for one. You know, I mean, you're working on that. It's part of your sanctification. It's part of your growth in Christ, part of your maturity. And sometimes there's the oopses on the way back. And so what's, that's what we have here. Now, here, to the dismay of the Pharisees and the teachers, they're going, what are you talking about? He's coming back? You know, what do you mean? Surely, Jesus, you've got it wrong. Surely you've got this story wrong because here's what Jesus says about this father. He says, while he was, a, was still a long way off, his father, listen, the verbs, saw him, was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. No self-respecting 
father of the day in that culture would ever do that. To run, pull up the tunic and run because something might be exposed, etc., 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 and then to offer some forgiveness to this guy who just took everything from him? Are you kidding me? That's not the way it's supposed to be. And the religious teachers especially are going, wait a minute, this isn't the way it works. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. What do you mean the Father welcomed him back? What do you mean he embraced him? What do you mean he received him with open arms? What do you mean he forgave him? You notice he forgave him before the young son could even ask for forgiveness. Because the act of returning was already the piece of the confession and repentance that was taking place. What do you mean celebrating? None, and I mean none, which means sinners, tax collectors, Pharisees, teachers of the law, none of these listeners, in, in essence, could even believe what was being told, was being shared with them. You see, every one of them, all of them, were surprised by grace. I pray today, as we move through this, that you are surprised by grace. I can't remember, Wendy, if we talked about what I was preaching on, but you chose, somebody chose, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. I mean, that's, that's how God works. These songs, they tie together. Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. You think this, this young son knew that song before Chris Tomlins did? <laughs> I think he experienced it. His chains being gone, freed up, back into the family, welcomed, and so forth. So, so here we have these who are at the table with Jesus, these sinners, these tax collectors, they're singing, oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. I mean, they're just singing it. They're thrilled. They're, you know, as the Duck Dynasty folks would say, oh, happy, happy, happy. You know, that's what they're living out right now. They are thrilled. But some of you have heard of Lee Corso on college game day. All I could think of was him saying this. Not so fast, my friend. Not so fast. Because here's the deal. We have the rest of the rest of the story now to talk about. See, so often this story stops right here, and everybody's all happy, happy, because this young son's back, he's been received back, you know, he's been welcomed, been forgiven, brought into the household, they're going to have a big old T-bone, life is good, you know. And we often forget that the story is about two sons, not just one. All right? Two sons. So what we see here is that grace is for all. Grace is for all. Now, you know, we live under the, the Wesleyan umbrella here, okay? And when we say grace is for all, we mean grace is for all, not just a chosen few. We mean that what Jesus did on the cross was for all people, was for all, not just a few that maybe were selected here or there, but for all people and that all of us have a, re a response, all of us have an opportunity to respond to what Jesus did on the cross. Grace is for all, and that's why it's such a surprise. You know, as we sang earlier, the amazing grace thing, grace is amazing. But here's the, here's the difficulty. It is also hard to comprehend. Think about it. And I've talked to some of you about this. You know who I'm talking to. And I talked to two or three this last week about this. Grace, as awesome as it is, as amazing as it is, as wonderful as it is, is so hard for us in our culture to understand or come to grips with, all right? Because everything we hear in our culture is about us earning something, working for something, that we might be worthy of it, you know. And so we've worked for it, we work for it. And yet grace is that free gift of God that's offered to us, independent of anything that we could ever say or do to deserve it. I mean, what could you ever do? Think about it. What could you ever do for God, for, for, for you to believe that you deserve God's love? I mean, where would you fit on this ladder, you know, from one to ten, if you think about it? You know, Mother Teresa, when they were talking about uh, how do you fit in this thing about feeling worthy before God, one to ten, she said, two and a half. And I'm going, man, I am toast here. This ladder, the rungs are actually below the ground then, if that's the case for me. Because, you know, think about that. 
But if she even herself couldn't earn God's love and all the wonderful things she did, then it had to be about something that God did that is offered to us freely and we respond accordingly. And so you have these things, you know, why, why in the world would we welcome back those who did us wrong? Well, look what the Father did, and that's, what, that's the point of this whole thing. It's, the, it's really the parable of the loving Father. And we say, but it's not fair. They don't deserve it. Well, let me ask you, I mean, really, do you? Do I? Now, let's, let's get more personal here. Let's think about some illustrations here, because this made people nervous in the 8 o'clock, and I think it will you too. Because we say it's just not right. It's just not right that grace would be offered to the BTK killer in jail, right? Or grace should never be offered to the Carr brothers, those of you who've been around Wichita for a while. Or grace should never be offered to the 911 terrorists, for sure. Do you see where I'm getting at? I mean, we like to be recipients, but we are not sure we want everybody to be a recipient. And yet, if sin is sin, look where it puts us all. But that's the reply of the religious leaders here. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, in essence, they're saying when Jesus began to talk about the love of this Father and the grace and mercy of this Father, they're going, that is such a waste of mercy. A waste of mercy. That's all they could see it as. And so here enters this older son who is very, very upset, very angry, and notice who's identifying now with the older son. It's religious folk. He is angry because the father offered grace and mercy to his own brother. And he is so angry, he is not willing to come and celebrate. And so what's he do is he refuses to join the party. There's a great celebration going on. But he refuses to join the party. He chooses to stay outside. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves right back to where we were in the beginning, that life is about choices. The young son made a bad choice. But in the midst of the bad choice, he made a choice to return. The old son, the older son, made a choice just to hang out there and think he was in without ever, need, never, without ever being in. And then chose not to go in when the Father came out to him. So we have this whole thing where, you know, grace is free, and yet there's a calling on us to respond to the freedom of that. I mean, I've told a lot of people this before. If you have a big old present under the Christmas tree, and it has your name on it, you're just going to go, oh, that's really nice, and never go open it? Really? I don't know many people who will do that. But that's what we do sometimes with God's grace is he offers it to us and yet we don't want to open it. There's some response on our part to open what it is that God has given us through his unconditional love, through his desire to welcome us back when we oops. So here's this younger son and all he represents, the tax collectors and the sinners. In essence, they're they're weeping with gratitude. I mean, they just can't believe that they can be received as a part of this family, of this celebration. They are not only surprised by grace, they, they are grateful for it. I, I mentioned earlier that uh, when, when Mary Lou and I were at a meeting in Georgia several years back, uh, I was with a group and there was a guy that was uh, from Alabama and he had held up a McDonald's store with a gun. And so anything that involves a gun in Alabama means you go straight to jail. Do not go pass go, do not collect $200, all right? Straight to jail. So he was in jail for a period of time, and then while he was in jail, he, uh, he had an encounter with the grace of God, and following uh, his release from jail, all he could talk about was how grateful he was that he was given a chance. Now there's gratitude and grace at work. He's like a younger son here. See, so this story is not just of one brother, but two, and both are sinners, and grace is offered to both. So as our praise band comes up here, I just want you to think about a few things here today. Two brothers, both sharing the same sin of pride, all right? Both of them sinful. One says, I don't need you, younger one. Other says, you owe me. I've been here all my life. 
One says he wants his freedom. The other wants his due. One says, I deserve the chance to leave. The other says, I deserve credit for staying put. They share the same sin, yet the difference is one returns home and the other refuses to go inside. The Father comes out to both. You notice the initiative of God's grace is on God. Okay? So the grace of God is initiated by God himself as he comes to both. He ran from the house as he saw the younger son, and he went outside the house to the older, actually inviting them both in. One chose to enter, to return. So here, here's the question, here's your homework for the week. Where do you fit into the story? Where do you find yourself? Younger son? Older son? Or how about this? Both. There's times, right? Right? Where do you fit into the story? Wrestle with that a little bit. What is your response then? What are you going to do about the grace of God that is offered freely to you? What are you going to do? That's on you. Life's about choices. In our prayers, we've been praying in the in the series, or actually in the devotions daily, when J.D. Waltz seedbed material. Last few weeks, it's been the, the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But notice this week, Lord Jesus God, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a son, a daughter. Grace at work. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. It is indeed amazing. And we thank you that you are such a good, good father, that you care deeply that all of your children would enter into the home to celebrate with you. And so, God, I pray that wherever we may be today, if we're struggling with this whole grace thing, if we're struggling with thinking we've got to work to be loved by you, uh, help us to be able to set that aside and to know that, that grace goes beyond that. It's, it's, it goes beyond in such a way that it comes from you independent of our works. Our works are a reflection of your grace, and out of gratitude, then we do those things that are right in your sight. Help us today. If we're the younger son, if we're the older son, if we are experiencing both of those things at times, God, help us to respond to your grace, because you indeed are a good, good Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing that song.